we'll, uh, we'll get started. Okay, so group number one, um, they had the example of uh, making a coffee using coffee machine, as I said, you know, not talking about an Nespresso machine, but just uh, something that's more industrial sized. Um, I, I know that you did a lot of work on that one, so. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so the tasks we had were um, grinding the coffee, heating and steaming the milk, and extracting the coffee and cleaning uh, the machine. Yep. And what were the sort of hazards that might come up from uh, doing it? Steam and hot water hazards, mm. uh, faulty equipment, general spills, um, inhaling or chemical contact, um, and then your crockery and glassware. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. And what sort of controls could you uh, Having put staff in place? trained in you know, making coffee and operating the machine, uh, using a thermometer in your milk, um, use the chemicals outside of opening hours so it's not coming into contact with anything the customer may get, um, and just keeping the area clean uh, mm. and organised. Yep. And that's probably an example where I can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think you probably wouldn't need any PPE there, protective equipment or anything like that. Um, I would have thought the chemicals pretty much are non-toxic in any way, but certainly the steam's obviously going to be a, a big issue there, uh, and burns and things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of uh, hazards, it's important that they're using administrative controls. So really training people to make sure they understand um, the requirements of actually using the machine. So, excellent. Thank you. Number two. Uh, we had the uh, lifting drop boxes from gaming machines. Yes, um, yeah. Components of the task are lifting the boxes, uh, possibly transporting the boxes, mm -hmm. and then counting the coins that are inside the box. Mm -hmm. um, possible hazards are uh, bending over, uh, lifting a heavy object, uh, dropping a he heavy object, and security um, hazards if you're doing it while the venue's open. Yes, absolutely. Yep, yeah. that's a, that's yeah. It's one that's hard to see, but certainly is a hazard. Absolutely. Yep. Um, also, going to be very loud when you're um, moving them around and pouring into counters and, mm. and that sort of stuff. Um, safety controls: um, if it's too heavy, don't lift on your own. Yep. Lift it with uh, another person. Um, training in the correct procedure for lifting a heavy object. Mm. Um, use of sack truck and an appropriate sack truck. Protective footwear, possibly. I don't think it's used very often to that, but oh, no. possibly. Um, moving the sack truck to where you're lifting the object from, not moving the object to the sack truck. Mm -hmm. um, and getting rid of coins and using note acceptors. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Oh, don't know about how the last one's going to go, but that's, that's a good idea. But um, yeah, so there's a lot of yeah, examples there of the hazards. So, uh, one thing I wanted to throw out open to the group is, you know, what are you guys doing out there in terms of gaming to help with that drop box issue? You know, what, are you using trolleys? Are you, I mean, I guess uh, some will have maybe more coins than others, but uh, what, what sort of things are you using at the, mo at the moment? Are you, are you using sack tr trucks, sack trucks, yeah? And two people to... Two people to lift, yeah. Two yeah. people for the whole job. Yeah. Mm. And just, yeah, common um, lifting procedures, bending your yeah. knees, keeping your back straight. Yeah, keeping your back straight, moving down, Working keeping it. Well, that's it, that's it. Um, but yeah, making sure that you're using correct manual handling techniques. So it could even be training as well on manual handling. Yep. Next group. Uh, we had the slicing meat using the meat slicer. Yeah. Um, the components were placing the meat on the slicer, slicing the meat, and then removing the meat. Yep. Um, the hazards we identified were just the sharp blade. Brilliant, excellent, that's really good, yeah. So, as you can see guys, that's, that's, you know, this is the basics of a standard operating procedure. Well done, that's excellent. Next group. We had uh, cleaning oven with oven cleaner. Yep. Um, bending down, spraying chemicals, um, scrubbing, and not moving heavy oven. Um, yep. uh, the hazards, um, the chemical burns, uh, fumes, um, slip, trip and fall, um, back strains, uh, bumping and bruising, cuts, uh, bumping head, uh, chemical or residue in the oven. Um, safety controls, uh, we've got PPE, so gloves, masks, 
uh, apron goggles. Um, what does that say? Pilot. Oh, pilot light switches uh, switched off if gas oven. Uh, turn power off if it's electric. Um, waiting to clean and or wait, yeah, waiting till the oven's cool to clean it. Um, uh, thorough rinsing of the oven. <laughs> That's really bad writing, what's that one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, protective footwear, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, we didn't have any uh, legislation on codes. No, that's... SDS maybe for the chemical yeah, so that. material safety yeah. data sheets, yes, absolutely. That's good, well done, excellent, very thorough. So, thank you. And last group? Uh, we had the one uh, making the bed in the guest room. Oh, no, it wasn't last, sorry. So the yeah. third one was obviously removing, removing the... Uh, <coughs> the items from the bed, if there was anything on there first. Stripping the bed, put clean sheets yeah, on the bed. Um, the hazards we had was bodily fluids, uh, back injuries and sharp objects. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, just um, wearing protective clothing, uh, bending from your knees and staff training. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, no, that's really good. I mean, certainly if you make one bed, that's one thing, but if you're doing 10 to 15 beds or more a day, and you're doing that every, you know, five five, five times uh, uh, during the week, every week of the year, then it starts to impact a lot. So, you know, when we're moving beds, we talk with room attendants about, you know, using their knees to actually go around and move the bed rather than actually dragging it or anything like that. And when they're going down, actually going down on uh, one knee to actually make the bed as well, rather than just bending over and doing it because of the strains on your back. So, yeah, now that's a good one. Excellent. And last one. If we, if we had storing beverages in the under, underfloor cellar, mm. uh, the uh, safe transfer of the stock, rotating the stock, and cleaning and general maintenance of the area. Some of the hazards, uh, falling stock, removing its kegs, so back injuries, etc. If it is a keg room, like with your fuel and stuff, you'd have your CO2 and your chemicals, um, and safety measures in place for uh, proper procedures for Moving heavy objects, uh, CO2 alarm, proper lighting, uh, safety equipment for your chemicals, so your goggles, your uh, gloves, etc. Uh, standard operating procedures for operating all of those things, um, and a general cleaning room so to make sure the area is safe to work. Brilliant, that's great. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. And also, um, in some cellar environments as well, just if there's a door that you know opens up, just making sure that if no one's around, that there's some sort of barrier there so that if it was potentially dark that someone couldn't just walk straight into it so yeah no, that's great terrific okay um, thank you very much for those and again you've just thrown up with this exercise and the last one probably about 10 different examples of hazards within your own uh, work environments okay Just moving on to the area of uh, policies and procedures. One of the things that I wanted to just start off by asking you is why we actually have policies and procedures in place in the workplace. What are, you, what are your thoughts there? Why would we have policies and procedures in place? If someone gets injured. Yeah, so if someone gets injured, what's our procedure once someone gets injured? Yeah, absolutely. Or not to get injured to start with, having mm. policies before. Injury yeah, so understanding what our procedures are so that we don't potentially harm ourselves through injury. Yeah, absolutely. To have a standard so we're not guessing. Yes, to have a standard within the workplace. If there's no policies and procedures, generally speaking, people might go, well, I'll just do it this way because that's the way I think it should be done and someone else might have a different way of doing it. And again, and I, the comment was made about bullying earlier, what, what might be acceptable to one might not be acceptable to another. So we need to have a set benchmark that we're all comfortable with in the work environment. What else? And I'm going to throw up an obvious one to say, well, from a legal, from a legal liability perspective, um, given that I work in the area of industrial relations, industrial relations a lot, um, although we are making sure that individuals when they start their employment we want to make sure that they're understanding of all the policies and procedures it's also important that down the track that they're not bre breaching those policies and procedures um, and often that may indeed be the subject of 
unfair dismissal claims and those sorts of things and we'll go through an example of that in a moment but certainly from a legal liability perspective it's important that we have policies and procedures in place as well. I'm just going to hand you um, two particular policies, one that's on first aid and another one which is on equal opportunity and discrimination. You can just read it amongst yourselves individually but once you've had some time to read through it I'm just going to throw it open to the group to ask some questions about what are some common themes that you're finding in these policies about more to do with the structure of the policy? So what are some common themes that you find between the two? Right. Thank you. Okay, so you've had the opportunity to read through those, um, those policies and procedures. Um, and I'll call them more policies, to be honest, but the policies. What are some common themes that you noticed? Obviously, they're two very different areas, but what are some common themes that you noticed between the two policies? Describes what all the customers, all the patients, staff, and the employees must do. Yeah, so it, it, it sets out what the employer needs to do, sets out what the employees might need to do, yeah, and it also talks about impacts with customers, yeah, excellent, yeah. What else? Anything else? No. A lot of uh, concerns and everything goes through management. Yeah, so what to do in the event there's a particular issue, talks about what to do if, if that issue arises, what, what processes we need to go through, how the issue needs to be raised, those sorts of things. And obviously, Policies will differ, will, will differ in terms of the topic, but certainly, yeah, what to do in the event that there is an issue. What about even just the structure of the policy? Who's signing off on it? The employee? Authorised representative of the hotel or the business or licensee. Okay. Yeah, so there needs to be, with policies and procedures, there needs to be a commitment from management that they've actually signed off to say, well, this is our overall policy, our procedure. Uh, so the PCBU, a representative of them, needs to be signing off on it. Otherwise, you could argue, well, is it really enforceable? If it's just something that the kitchen, for example, have decided upon as a policy, is it actually enforceable if management don't know that it even exists? So really, it needs to have commitment from management that it's been signed off and authorised. Also in terms of dates and things, we put dates on because policies need to get reviewed. You know, you could say, well look, every 12 months let's review our policies and procedures. But policies need to be reviewed because uh, businesses change. The legislation changes, so you don't want a situation where someone is, and often we do see it, someone signed off on something many, many years ago, but things have changed over the years but the policy hasn't been updated. So the policy that's in existence at that business at the moment is just not valid because it's not up with the current legislation. Also probably the key sorts of things as well is, you know, it, most policies generally will want to show what the company is trying to achieve. You know, why do we have this policy in place? Well, you know, if it's about first aid, well really it's about having best practice first aid within the workplace. It's about making sure people understand what to do in the event of an injury. As uh, you mentioned earlier, it talks about you know, the role of individuals within the company needs to be approved and needs to be consistently reviewed. I've got a uh, particular case, and if you've got um, you know, any opportunity when you're doing your studies to have a look at this case, this was um, an unfair dismissal matter that was before the Fair Work Commission. Um, and uh, there's a reference to it there and it involved three employees that were terminated from uh, Australia Post and I, I'm just going to run through a little bit about this particular case but there are a couple of key things amongst a lot of other things but a couple of key things about policies generally and trying to enforce policies. So in this particular case there were three uh, employees that were terminated by Australia Post and their, their employment was terminated on the basis that they had seriously breached the company's IT policy, uh, particularly through the sending of offensive emails 
to friends and, uh, and work colleagues that were of a sexually explicit nature, so pornographic uh, emails. Now the company uh, had a policy in place for many, many years, but they also put in, in about 2010 from memory, a new email filter. And with that email filter, it was better, and I don't know the IT behind it, but it better accessed uh, what people were sending through in terms of their emails. And as a result of this filter, it, it uncovered that there were a number of employees, uh, around 40 I believe, um, where they had, there had been offensive emails that had been sent. So as a result of this, uh, Australia Post then went down the path of going through disciplinary action with a number of these employees. And the, and the type of action range from uh, a warning uh, to simply being notified not to undertake that behaviour again, right the way through to termination. So there were variances depending on the nature of the emails that had been sent. Now there were three employees in particular that, ha that were terminated um, as a result of this process and they actually lodged an unfair dismissal claim in the Fair Work Commission. So were they warned previously or just terminated no, they were, ter they were terminated on the basis that they'd seriously breached the IT policy. Yeah. So were serious they and warned about their emails being sent or No, not in this instance. No. <coughs> no, they weren't. Yeah. So so they'd put in this email filter. Yeah. They'd uncovered all this information and then identified that these individuals had sent these emails. As a result of that, their employment was then terminated. Yeah. Um, so they lodged an unfair dismissal claim, uh, the three employees, and it was before a single member of the tribunal, the Fair Work Commission, so a commissioner. Um, and in that particular instance, the commissioner listened to all of the facts surrounding this particular case. And the commissioner found that two of the employees, in terms of their dismissal, uh, the commissioner stated that they found that, that, that the dismissal was valid, that the IT policy was there, it was in place, it was clear, and at the end of the day, the companies made that decision to terminate them on that basis, that they'd seriously breached it. But with one of the employees, uh, they'd said, well, we actually think if we're taking into consideration all of the circumstances around this, and I'll come, this, come to this in a moment, all of the circumstances around this case, I think that this, person's dismiss this particular person's dismissal was unfair. And he actually, uh, uh, and he was awarded, well, in the decision, compensation. But what actually happened was that when these three employees originally lodged their claim, they were seeking uh, reinstatement. So it wasn't just compensation, but reinstatement. Then, um, <coughs> excuse me, all three employees therefore appealed the decision of the commissioner. And when doing that, uh, it went before uh, a, what they call a full bench of the Fair Work Commission. So a number of uh, members of the commission then heard the appeal and each one of them was seeking reinstatement. And when the appeal was heard, the full bench, in terms of handing down its decision, found that in taking into consideration all the circumstances around these cases, that the dismissal of the three employees was actually unfair and subsequently ordered that they be reinstated back into the company. Now some of the considerations that were taken into account, and this raised a lot of commentary from an industrial relations perspective and through practitioners generally because of the sending of pornographic emails. Some of the considerations that the bench took into consideration were things like the length of service of these employees. All of them had been there for over uh, 10 years from memory. The age of the employees, the fact that they had had an unblemished record uh, over all that time, so hadn't previously received any particular warnings. The fact that there'd also been a disproportionate punishment from what the full bench is saying for this, these particular individuals in comparison to the others was also taken into consideration. But the reason that I'm also raising this particular case is that from a policy point of view it also raised a number of other questions. What they'd found was that yes there was a very strict IT policy in place um, within Australia Post. But at this particular location, the bench made the suggestion that there was a culture of emails being sent around that were of offensive nature for a long period of time, even between employees and managers. So there, there was a culture of sending this information uh, previously 
and also that during that time people had gone effectively unpunished for breaching the IT policy before. So that was one thing. The second thing was that they said, okay, well, in their view, Australia Post should have taken steps to actually uh, notify the employees of the introduction of this new email filter and therefore what the consequences might be if they breach the email filter. So again, I'm raising that because it's a question about making sure that the policies are updated. And the other thing that really came out of it was that by, you might have a zero tolerance policy in place, but the reality is that when it comes to terminating an employee's employment, you need to take in all the circumstances surrounding that particular case, not just the policy itself. So the I suppose the message that I'm trying to give you there is that you can have a zero tolerance policy on something, but ultimately if you terminate an employee on the basis that you're saying, well, they've breached it, it may not be enough and you may need to take into consideration other factors before you actually go down the path of potentially terminating an employee. Uh, particularly if culturally there'd been, uh, um, uh, there'd been a, a culture where individuals uh, were allowed to just simply send emails and nothing had previously happened. So it's just a point to make about the importance of policies, updating them, and just because you've got a policy doesn't mean that you necessarily are going to be able to terminate that particular employee. All right. Okay. Auditing. Um, What's your view on that, Owen? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, look, I have a bit of an issue with it because at the end of the day, the, the cultural thing is the one that stands out for me. If, if there'd been this sort of thing going on for a long period of time mm. and no one had done anything about it, then they introduced something and then someone was terminated because of it, mm. um, I would probably argue, look, we need to draw a line in the sand and say, right, from here on in, guys, this is what's happening and anyone who breaches it from here on in could possibly be terminated. And I think that's where, where it got unstuck for them. But they certainly said in the decision, no problems with the policy and no problems with the fact that it was clear that it said, okay, if you breach this policy, you could be terminated. So it's that issue about if you're going to if you're going to um, rely on a policy, drawing a line in the sand, letting everyone know that this is this is uh, in place and the ramifications from it, yeah. But prior to that, what happens mm. if, you know, obviously emails were in the centre around, an email got sent to someone, someone took offence to that. Yep. And then reported it. Yep. And then they're like, well, we try to dismiss the person. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> Look, it's a good question. Yeah, we uh, tried to get rid of them, but we couldn't. Or we tried yeah, to yeah, yeah. I mean, look, whether you take the approach of uh, we disciplined them, we gave them a first and final written warning for argument's sake to not do that again. It created offence to another individual. Do it again, and you're going to your employment might be terminated. That might be a, a way of trying to deal with it. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's also a question about. Uh, and again, it's a good question about someone taking offence and others not. Mm. And this question of, well, we don't know if someone's going to take offence or not. That's why we have these policies in place, because who knows whether someone might take offence to it or not. So we need to set that, be that benchmark, that standard. Yeah. Okay, auditing. I don't want to spend uh, a lot of time on auditing, but suffice to say that um, when you leave today, there is uh, a copy of... In fact, Noel, if you can just pass that around. I've given you the first page, if you wouldn't mind just passing uh, it around, it's only one sheet. I've given you the first page of an example of a work health and safety quarterly inspection audit. Um, here we've talked about fire and emergency evacuation and first aid. But it's really just to kind of send you on your way to say, well, okay, if I was going to order the premises, if I was going to do a physical observation of the premises, what are the sorts of things that I'd look at? And importantly, do we have these in place? If we don't, what action do we require? Who's actually going to do it? So by whom? And by when? What sort of time frames are we going to put in place? So if I was going to do a physical audit of the workplace from a work health and safety perspective, 
What sort of things do you think I would look at? What sort of areas do you think you might concentrate on? Yeah, so, sorry? Yeah, so chemical areas, so your hazardous substances, are they stored in an appropriate place? Um, are they locked, for example, when not in use? Do you have personal protective equipment when you're dispensing it? Um, are people getting trained in, thanks very much, trained in chemical use, yeah. What else? Floors, um, ceiling, surfaces. Yeah, so floors, so making sure... Yeah, so, yeah, things aren't potentially dangerous, yeah, but floors as well. Um, making sure that, you know, from a floor point of view, that you've got all the boxes and things like that are out of the way and there aren't things that are potentially going to cause slips and hazards. Absolutely. Do you need mats that are down? If mats are frayed and they're going to cause tripping hazards? Absolutely. What else? Entry and exit points. Yeah, so entry and exits. Do you have emergency evacuation signs? Oh, sorry, do you have exit signs that are illuminated? You know, the people, uh, are people easily able to get out of the back of house areas, the front of house and out, the, out, out of the hotel? Do we have things in their way, in aisles and things like that? Yeah. What else? Doing well so far. Public areas and that as well? Where the general public are, like the toilets and yep. just you know, foyers and... Yeah. Sort of yeah, making sure there's no sort of hazards that could cause yeah. potential for injury. Cement falling down on heads or anything like that. Yeah, that's right. Things like, you know, uh, high, high chairs, you know, for, for babies, you know, are they all operating properly? Are they working properly? Yeah. Middle of the night, all the lights go out. Have we got emergency lighting that's going to come on? Are there sprinklers in the hotel, you know, in the event of uh, potential fire? Things like manual handling, you know, uh, if we're in the bottle shop, do we have sack, sack, sack trucks, sorry, available for, you know, moving boxes and those sorts of things and cartons of beer? If someone's going to operate a forklift, do they need to have a forklift licence? Do security measures come under this as well? So security. Like, if you are in a bottle shop, if you are in a game room, you know, those kind of things. Yeah. What, what, what security measures are there in place? If there's an armed hold-up, what do you do? Do you have a procedure in place if there is an armed hold-up? Do you have duress alarms? Yeah. Or, or pen alarms? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a myriad of different areas. You know, if someone had a pool, I'm not suggesting where you're working, they did have a pool, but if I looked at an accommodation venue, who's testing the pH levels? Is the person competent? Where do they store the chemicals? You know, all those sorts of things um, form part of an overall audit. We're not expecting you to have 30 years of experience in work health and safety to, to, to conduct that full audit, but certainly it gives you an idea of the sort of things that you would need to look at in terms of identifying hazards. Okay. Records. What sort of um, records do you think we need to keep from a work health and safety perspective in the workplace? Yeah, important not only for employees that might get injured, but also members of the public that are saying they've slipped over or fallen over from an insurance perspective. Yeah. What other records? Sorry? Audit logs. Yeah, so if we're doing an audit, it's important that you keep records of these. If, if I'm a Safe Work SA inspector coming into the work site, I would like to see the fact that you've gone through an audit process, you've looked at the hazards within the workplace and you've actually made an attempt to try and fix any hazards that you've identified, yeah. Machine maintenance and servicing? Yeah, servicing of machines, so logs of when machines got fixed. Security? <coughs> security? In oh yeah, in terms of logging security staff, yeah. Yeah, making sure they're coming in and out of the premises, yeah. Training registers, yeah. So if I'm undertaking training in manual handling, for argument's sake, it's important there's a record of who's actually done it. Just staff logs as well, so you can see who was there and when. Yep. That sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. What about first aid kits? Yeah. So having a register there in the first aid kit, what's going in, what's going out. If there's a first aider on the premises, are they actually uh, signing off to say, well, this has actually been given to... 
a particular individual. Yeah. Chemicals, a register of the chemicals that uh, you've got on site. Do you have material safety data sheets for each of those chemicals you've got on site? How are they used? Uh, and often you'll see examples of hazardous substances registers. If someone gets a, a substance in their eye, for example, what, what, it'll actually have it specified in terms of what we need to do in the event of an emergency. Yeah, yeah, okay. So they're the sorts of records that we need to keep. Contractors is probably the other big one, you know, and it's one that often gets missed, particularly in a hotel environment. So your contractors going in and out of your hotel or the ones, you know, if you have an electrician coming to work in the hotel, we always recommend that we get a copy of their public liability insurance, their current public liability insurance. If they're registered for work cover, copy of their own work cover certificate of competent, uh, registration. If they're using any chemicals or anything on site, they tell us what chemicals they're using. So it's important that contractors as well, you're getting that sort of information from them. How we record them at the end of the day, well, at the end of the day, it can be either in a paper copy and in folders and those sorts of things, or it, be, or it can be kept on the computer. Um, I've used uh, external providers that have done mock evacuations, fire evacuations, uh, and those companies have recorded everything on their own websites. So you've got easy access as a hotel to be able to go, yep, this is when we did our last evacuations. And these are who the wardens are. So they're the sort of records that we, we need to focus on. Goes without saying that ultimately if we don't ensure that we're compliant from a workplace perspective when it comes to work health and safety, diversity, bullying, those sort of areas, it's going to create issues. And I'm just throwing up there, you know, we will quite often get media releases come through from Safe Work SA uh, where there may have been a uh, prosecution where a business um, where unfortunately an employee might have severely injured themselves in a business. It might or might not surprise you to know that you know, there's almost 200 fatalities that occur every year in Australia as a result of people going to work. So workplace fatalities. Um, thankfully, hospitality is one of those areas where we don't have uh, a significant number of fatalities or, or extremely serious injuries because we're not using some of the more hazardous types of machinery, for example. But certainly uh, there are a significant, people that, significant number of people that would lose their life or even arms or uh, might be legs, whatever the case may be. So it's important that we actually go through all these processes and procedures to try and stop some of this happening. And I've put up the name work cover there as well because as many of you, many of you would be aware that if an individual is injured at work, it may mean that they lose time from attending work. So there's ramifications from a work cover perspective in terms of paying out wages for that individual while they're not at work. And for the individual that's injured, they're unfortunately feeling pretty down because they can't be at work as well. So there's a whole heap of ramifications by not complying with the legislation. Needless to say as well that when we introduced the legislation, the, the Work Health and Safety Act, or well not we, but when Parliament passed it, um, uh, both from a legislative point of view, it meant that there were more significant penalties that exist than what previously existed in South Australia. So as you can see, uh, there's different categories and I'm not going to try and attempt to explain each category, but there are certainly different categories and different fines that apply for both individuals and the company uh, if there is a, a serious breach of the Work, Work Health and Safety Act or regulations. One of the things that I thought I'd mention about workplace bullying is that um, it, it got a lot of uh, publicity probably in the last well, four years or so. But there was a particular case in, in, in Melbourne involving uh, a young lady by the name of Brodie Panlock, who in September 2006 unfortunately took her life, um, which was a tragic you know, circumstance for obviously for her and her family. Um, with this scenario, prior to uh, uh, Brody actually committing suicide, she was subjected to significant uh, bullying within her workplace. Um, and there were three co-workers that were involved in this particular bullying. 
And in terms of prosecutions, the business and those that were bullying her were, were fined over $300,000. Some of the bullying occurred both physical and non-physical uh, abuse and were quite horrendous in terms of um, what actually took place. And it's miraculous that she even put up with it as she did for so long. But what actually happened there was that in Victoria, it, it resulted in there being a change to um, the Victorian Crimes Act. And uh, what they introduced was new anti-bullying legislation where they said that uh, making serious uh, bullying, a crime punishable by up to 10 years imprisonment. And it became known as something called Brody's Law. Um, but if you get the opportunity, and I'd certainly have a read about this particular case because it was a catalyst for a lot of change, particularly in the workplace bullying arena. We don't have it under the Crimes Act here in South Australia, but certainly in Victoria they do. Okay, so finishing off today, we've, we've really talked about um, some resources and things like that. Uh, you will get a copy of the presentation as you, as you uh, leave today, but, but, but um, for those of you who are trying to find out more information and resources, there's some websites up there. Um, certainly recommend Safe Work, Equal Opportunities, and also the SA Legislation website um, also gives you all the up-to-date legislation as, as well. Before we finish off, um, there's probably two things. One is I want to thank you very much for your, your, your attendance and time today and your interaction as well. I've really appreciated it. Um, also, whether you've got any questions that you might want to ask, and I know that Fleur also wants to talk to you about, I believe, the assessment and a few other details as well. So uh, you need to just hang on for a little bit longer. But did anyone have any questions at all? Or? A fair bit of information in a short period of time, so yeah. Are you going Thank to be you. Available to yes, they yes, ask yes. After today? I will leave my details uh, with Fleur to make sure that uh, if you've got any questions, just please give me a call. Oh, sorry, there is one other thing. Um, in terms of policies and procedures, I know that everyone here, the hotels, are members of the AHA, the Australian Hotels Association. We actually have for our members a policies and procedures. Pack. So we've got a work health and safety package uh, that we provide to members at no cost. It's in word format. Where you access that is through the members only section of the website. So you need to do some smooth talking with your, um, your managers or your, uh, your owners to say, have you got the password? Um, so that you can just go in there into the members only section and you can actually download it. You may find that they might have already done that themselves when you go to have a look at the policies and procedures that are already in your workplace. Um, if you're having issues with that still, don't know passwords and those sort of things, please give me a call and we'll organise it for the purposes of what we're, what we're doing here. Yeah, so. All right. Thanks, Owen. Yep, no worries. Thank you. Thank you.